first, let me say what a great pleasure it is to, to be in Bangkok. Um, this is uh, Hai Tong's first, first time, and i um, very pleased to, um, to speak to everyone. Um, well, I'm part of the Hai Tong research team. Um, obviously, we've got a very big presence in the uh, domestic market. We have 200 analysts um, covering all the different sectors. We also have one of the, um, the best, Zhang Chao. He's a sort of quite famous Chinese economist in the, uh, in the mainland markets. Um, he has about 2 million followers on WeChat. So he's sort of quite a key, key person to follow there. Uh, we have a very good um, Xu Genz, our Asia strategist. Um, and you may think, of, well, why have they sent a, why they sent a Westerner to talk about China? But um, um, I started covering China back in 2007. Um, and then looked at sort of basically Chinese government policy. We had a research company in Beijing um, trying to explain how Chinese government policy worked to international investors, which wasn't possibly the easiest thing to do. Um, but then I joined Hai Tong in 2015, when Hai Tong really started its international um, expansion. Because obviously a lot of it's taking what's happening in China and applying it to a global context, um, as well as educating investors like yourself about what's happening in the domestic markets. So that's my job, um, and hopefully I'll be able to uh, talk you through the key points um, in what's happening today. So, when people think about China's economy at the moment, uh, particularly outside China, um, the key thing is trade. What's going to happen with the trade war? But when you, have, when you look at China's actual, actual economic performance, you have two very, very different um, aspects. One is the liquidity. Um, basically, the domestic market liquidity, the, the, the financing of the economy. And the second is the trade war. And this is particularly the case. So basically, 2018 was not a great year for China economically. Um, the stock market fell. The stock market went into bear territory. You had a significant slowdown. Um, industrial production and, and fixed asset investment, particularly on the state side. And a lot of this became all wrapped up in the rhetoric. It was like, oh yeah, this is a trade war, it's like lack of confidence, it's, it's all hitting home. But in actual fact, um, the key problem last year was deleveraging. Um, it was a domestic issue, it was, a, it was basically China's monetary, monetary policy changing. Um, and the trade war was much more rhetoric. It was, um, you know, there was lots of concern about it. Um, but to be honest, it didn't really hit home um, until we got to Q4. So all of the change last year was about deleveraging. Um, that stopped in October. So basically they declared deleveraging, deleveraging is dead um, in, in October. And we're now in a very different phase. We're in a sort of much more stable phase on the, on the liquidity side. But the trouble is this year is when the trade war is starting to hit. And this is what, um, this is what it affects our outlook for H2 um, and beyond. But the interesting thing is we'll cover is um, China, if you think back to the last time you saw a major problem with trade, 2008, China's following a very, very different path this time. So last time, 2008, it basically went, okay, my God, we just got to shovel huge amounts of money out the door, um, lending, anyway, to local government financing platforms, infrastructure plans, um, leveraging up the corporate we still left with that overhang today. So now, it's not going through a sim similar sort of emergency stimulus plan. It's instead trying to change its economy. Um, and in some ways, the trade war is actually accelerating a lot of the changes that you're going to see in China's economy over the long term. And that's switching to capital markets, switching to market-based financing, encouraging more foreign investment in, despite maybe not the Americans so much anymore, but the uh, um, but definitely um, other other, um, other countries. And then also trying to sort of boost its tech investment and sort of more and more R&D. So a lot of the changes that already want to ha uh, um, take place in China are being, are being pushed forward now um, by the government. Um, so I'll just sort of run through all those different aspects and then obviously we can use, we'll move to sort of Q&A um, if anyone's got any questions at the end. Um, because the, the deleveraging um, in China has been significant. And the, the importance of this is because when people think of China, I mean, I've been covering China as they, since 2007, and every year people go, no, surely this is the year. This is the year that China's going to go bust. 
Um, it's going to have its Lehman moment. It's going to crash. It's, you know, it's got too much corporate debt. Um, last year was the first time China went, okay, we're going we're gonna to really tackle this. And this is, um, if, if you're an economist, you get sort of excited about charts like this, but the, that's one of my favorite charts, because um, it shows the gradual complexity built up in China's um, financial system. Um, not only did you have corporate debt coming in, but you had um, trust loans, entrusted loans, uh, corporate bill financing, you had P2P financing, and then there was sort of channeling through wealth management products. And basically, you built up this massive um, complexity of financial and quite a lot of leverage. You, you know, um, corporate leverage famously sort of up to 170% of GDP, um, one of the highest in the world. Um, but within that, as well, because you had the increasing complexity, the risks were becoming almost unmanageable and very, very difficult to, 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 to work out. You know, if, 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 if one bank went lost over there, what would be the, what would be the ramifications um, through the entire economy? No one really knew. So they had to deleverage. They successfully did that last year, but that had the economic hit. But basically, then when the the trade war impact started coming through in Q3, and you had a really sort of downturn in the Chinese in the Chinese markets in Q3 last year uh, was possibly the worst. That was when, and you can see basically from October onwards, you've now got much more accommodative monetary policy stance, and crucially, that's when the market started to recover. So instead of it, the trade war being the, the key influence on the equity markets in particular. Um, you have to look at basically what's happening with monetary policy to drive a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the asset growth. Um, and basically now we're in a situation where the overall conditions are kind of stabilised. So that means on a domestic level, um, China's getting back to uh, stability, which is where it wants to be. So then we come on to the trade war. Um, so the trade war was never just about trade. Um, if it had just been about the trade surplus, it could have been fixed in maybe two, three months' time. Um, China could have imported some more soybeans, uh, it could have exported less, um, and, and, and the, the negotiations would have been very, very simple. But the trouble is that the negotiations are about much, much more than that. So it's about the technology, it's about the IP, it's about the, um, the, the entire 5G industrial chain, and basically you're going to have you know, an ongoing US-China battle um, going on, even with trade war uh, negotiations continuing. Um, so in terms of what we now see, sort of obviously the main, um, the, um, the main halt has now, has now been impaired slightly by the Osaka dinner. So, so they're now talking together again, that's nice, they've had a few phone calls. Um, we're getting, we, we might get a few more sort of you know, constructive talks coming in, but there's no great optimism either domestically or internationally for a major breakthrough. Um, and this is partly because China is taking a much more um, tough stance uh, than many, many. I mean, I think uh, China, um, the US, underestimated how China sees this. It's no longer, it's not about the trade surplus. It's about our long-term future. And if it's about the long-term future, China is prepared to take a hit. Um, and you've seen this before. So if you think of the anti-corruption campaign in 2013, it's like, no, we'll take an economic hit in order to ensure our long-term future. Similarly with deleveraging, we'll take the hit, we'll, we'll remove the risk. With this time round, it's like, no, if, if, if the greatest hit to GDP is one percentage point, um, we'll take that hit. Um, and then grow in the future. And so the idea that sort of it's going to back down in the face of an economic slowdown is probably too optimistic. So you get potentially another protracted negotiation that takes six to nine months. Maybe the US doesn't force China to do quite so much on the, over its um, um, state-owned state -owned enterprises. Maybe China doesn't force the US to buy quite so much. Um, and so you get some accommodation. But the real concern is not so much the trade war, I think pretty much everyone knows what the, the trade war impact is going to be potentially up to one percentage points. Um, but what we're getting now is the unintended consequences um, because we're now in a protracted negotiation. 
Um, and the real risk to China is not so much so on the, on the trade side, um, just in terms of the exports. A lot of it can be rerouted or, or sort of redirected. But it's actually the, the, the second round effects of people not investing in China anymore. The uncertainty means that you've got lower fixed asset investment on the manufacturing side, and particularly for US companies. So basically, this is in some ways accelerating a trend that was happening already. A lot of manufacturers are going, well, China is no longer a low cost destination, wages are quite high, land costs are quite high, subsidies are not so good, and also there's quite a lot of domestic competition that we have to cope with. So, to be honest, China was getting a little bit less competitive as a destination anyway, and now with tariffs it becomes less, um, less attractive. So you're now getting, you can see that um, the US investment is now slowing down. So what does China do to counterbalance that and try to get back to a state of stability again? It's now opening up. So foreign ownership, um, it's removed basically foreign ownership in oil and gas, um, financial services, um, and a lot of the sort of marketing, communications, and some of the sort of more service-related sectors where previously um, there'd been a lot of restrictions foreign, foreign companies couldn't come in. But the interesting side about this this again accelerates some of the key trends that China um, was happening anyway. Because if a lot of this money is coming in not from America and not from manufacturing, but it's coming in in the services side of the economy, particularly things like financial services. Um, because while Hyton is coming in, there's an awful lot of companies that are now going, you know, like Fidelity, Schroders, uh, UBS are all setting up in all setting up in Shanghai. So you do now have um, a lot of investment, particularly from the European side, um, coming back into coming back into China and offsetting some of that sort of manufacturing investment which is going um, which is going elsewhere. So the you do have the, the, the trade war impact is not as simple as just looking at the trade surplus, but you've got a switch in the economy which is potentially going to uh, going to accelerate. So in terms of how this then plays out in total, um, what we see is you've got basically industrial production. I mean, that, that, that is going to be affected by the trade war. That slows down. Um, we don't see a huge, a huge growth in the manufacturing side and in the industrial production side. However, um, what we are seeing is this, again, an accelerated shift in cons consumption. Um, one of the key things that China did to help offset, we've had a bit of monetary easing, and we expect more, we'll, we'll, we'll come to. But the other thing it did, as I say, in very sharp contrast to the four trillion stimulus package in 2008, um, basically China said, okay, we can't raise much more debt, we'll give people more money. Um, and we'll give households more money in particular. And so this came in the form of tax cuts and fee cuts. And it's not huge in terms of, I mean, it's, it's sizable in terms of, um, it's about one to two trillion um, total impact. But in terms of individual households, you basically get about an extra $200 in your pocket every month if you're a taxpayer. So not massive, but it is helping basically in terms of spending on consumer staples, there's a bit more money to spend on holidays, there's a bit more money to, you know, if you fancy going out to dinner. And so this is actually accelerating the bit of the economy, which is doing well, um, is consumer staples and a bit of the luxuries. People are still buying lipsticks, people are still buying a lot of the luxury, sort of low end luxury goods. So that bit of the economy is still really strong. Um, and so, so we, we, we see that sort of that's where the, um, if you like, the government stimulus has gone, has gone into people's actual pockets and then they're going out and spending. Um, and meanwhile, you've got basically the property market, which has always been the kind of, you know, once again, the, sort of the China boogeyman is it, when's the property market going to crash? It's not. It's, I mean, it may crash in the future, but at the moment, it's kind of trundling along at 5 10%. A lot of the oversupply has come out of the market. But basically, you're getting sort of 5 10% um, growth in both sales and in construction. And that kind of just helps the economy stabilize. It doesn't mean you have a huge rocketing growth. But similarly, you don't have a, a, a massive slide as well, which again is, is, a, is a massive um, 
part of the economy and, and also as a stabilization in, in the face of the trade war. So basically you've got property fine, consumption fine, um, and then the bit that's going sort of the manufacturing fixed asset investment, which is slowing uh, because of the, the trade war, that's now being offset by a lot of more um, local government spending. And you could say, oh yeah, but come on, this is the this is the infrastructure plans, these are all the you know stuff they did before, all the bridges to nowhere, all the um, you know, redundant uh, redundant uh, things like utilities, plants, etc. No one needs them and they're and they're loss making and, and they're just economic efficiency. But an interesting thing about this infrastructure plan is it includes crucially by a gene. Um, and so a lot of the local governments are now spending on um, 5G infrastructure, smart city infrastructure. A lot of it might be wasted, a lot of it might not work. Um, there's been a few little embarrassments about sort of some autonomous vehicles that haven't quite gone where they're meant to have gone. Um, but you do have, um, on a national level, basically investment not going into necessarily old infrastructure, but a lot of the new infrastructure which is designed to basically build the next generation. So, it's not all, even, even on the, you know, the, the state-owned side, you're not necessarily seeing completely wasteful and it is accelerating that change. But, you may say, okay, well this is fine, Miranda, this, you know, all, all looks lovely, more tax cuts, you've got some, some more state spending, yes, and then the property market's fine. Um, but coming back to the original problem about liquidity, where is that coming from? Um, and this is where people like us come in. Uh, because a lot of it is going to come not from debt, um, but from capital markets. Because basically on the debt side, China has very, very limited room. This is, this is quite a, a well-known phenomenon. Um, China's debt, yes, everyone knows China has too much debt, but crucially it has too much corporate debt. Now, it, up to 170%. So that was basically all your uh, problems about you know, where all the defaults were going to come in, where all the inefficiencies come in, and basically where you know, trying to leave the moment was meant to come from. Um, a lot of it was state backed though. So this is why you've not seen a massive defaults coming through the system, because a lot of it was SOE. So it's still, it's still there, but basically that's now stabilizing, and now gradually, amazingly enough, being paid off. It actually is the corporate debt to GDP fell in 2018 for the first time ever. Um, now, the question is on the households. Now, households are an interesting one. Household debt, um, I remember arguing in 2013 that China's next wave of debt could be households, and people would go, Miranda, you don't know what you're talking about. You're obviously some stupid Westerner that doesn't understand that Chinese people don't get debt. Um, but within a space of just a very few years, um, you did actually have a huge growth in mortgages, but also things like uh, auto financing um, and P2P financing, which meant people could take things like payday loans. And the younger generation, where you have a much bigger willingness to shift money around on your mobile Alipay platform, then instead of going, oh my god, I've got to go to the bank, and I've got to ask for a loan, and this is going to take me awful, and I'll, I'll have the shame of debt hanging over me, you sort of look at Alipay and you go, oh, tell you about it, and go, hmm, quite fancy, quite fancy going out to dinner, can't quite afford it, I know, I'll just take out, a, I'll just have a little, little advance on my salary. And you end up with a consumer debt culture, which is something that China has never had before. Um, it accelerated significantly in 2016, 17, and then suddenly the government went, oh, hang on a moment, we could get a huge consumer debt binge and then, and then a massive risk. So they started to pull back on that. P2P financing was one of the part of the leveraging campaign last year. Um, basically, that's now growing. So household debt's still growing, but in a much more constrained fashion. Um, and if you want to think about the importance of that for the economy, if you, you just need to look at the auto market. Um, the auto market has been exceptionally bad in China over the last year, down 18%. Uh, a lot of that is because people were previously taking out auto loans and they could no longer do so. But we still see that sort of basically supportive, but not massively. Um, but then the, 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 the bit which does change and does grow 
is the government debt. Um, government debt um, in terms of central government debt, but also the local governments replacing a lot of the old corporate debt, um, but also funding a lot of the new infrastructure projects. So that's basically where you get, you're, you're removing a lot of the higher, higher risk corporate debt, changing it into, into basically fiscal debt. Um, so it changes the risk profile of China's um, debt profile significantly. And overall, we expect it to basically come in debt rises slightly, but not to such extreme levels as Japan. Um, so, but in terms of where else the money used to come from, and it's now no longer coming from, and this is more or particularly for where foreign money is coming from. So as we were saying, with the trade surplus, with the trade war, that's going to fall. China used to get a very nice $30 billion every month flowing into its, uh, <coughs> into its coffers. Um, which is very supportive to the economy, um, but that's now that's now dwindling. Not only have you got the trade surplus itself in terms of goods falling, but you've also got China going out and spending more money, um, as you will see in Thailand, no doubt, on things like tourism, um, and particularly in Europe as well. So the more money comes out through tourism, transportation, um, and also things like IP payments. So China's not getting that boost to its economy anymore. From, from, from the trade side. So it's got to search for money for elsewhere. But instead, um, the other alternative is you look for foreign money coming in, to direct investment. But again, the trade was affecting that. You're not getting that boost, which used to be about $10 billion every month would come in. Again, that was a key support in the 1990s, and it's remained a, a key factor all over the last decade. So if you're not getting the trade surplus coming in, and you're not getting the direct investment coming in, where do you get it from? So now we go into capital markets. And this is the change in both China's domestic structure, um, but also its, its international um, exposure as well. Hence why Haitong is uh, in, in, some ways, in some ways here. Um, because China's in response to a lot of the um, concerns raised by the US and Europe, it's opening up its capital markets, it's opening up its um, capital account in terms of inflows. And obviously things like MSCI inclusion, which is going to um, lead to, that's led to significant flows into the equity market, um, but also the bond market. Um, they made bond market um, the, the very, very simple to invest in for foreign investors. Uh, the CIBM was opened up in 2016-17. Um, and this has basically led to, instead of 10 billion of direct investment, you've got about 10 to 15 billion dollars every month flowing into China into the bond and equity markets. Um, and so basically you're now seeing um, more foreign money going in. And this mirrors what's going on domestically as well. Um, if you look at the, you know, go back to the chart on sort of the complex chart of total social financing, a lot of the money which used to be in shadow banking, um, so the trusted loans, the sort of slightly hidden debt, um, that you, you are sort of never quite sure where, where the risk lay, it's now going to capital market financing, which is then more transparent, uh, where the risks are much more um, readily, um, you, well, you can, you can see much more easily on sort of both equity and debt side. Um, and also, it, it's a more market-based financing, so you don't have a lot of a lot of the structural inefficiencies which led to bad debts accumulating in the system is being going to be ironed out by through market-based financing. China is going to move to a more like a, a market-based benchmark interest rate, uh, which then becomes becomes more like the Fed policy rate, so the U.S. Fed rate. Um, it, it's taking a lot of the um, state-owned enterprise ec um, debt, turning it into equity. So you, you end up with full risk on your on your SOE exposure. Um, and, th and then it's basically encouraging more institutional equity investment in the by um, individuals in China as well, as well as by foreign investors. And a key part of that um, is going to be um, we, in, on the 22nd of July, we have the new equity, so, so, so China's NASDAQ is going to be launched in Shanghai. 
Um, now, this is potentially transformative for Chinese equity markets. You've always had the Shanghai comp, you've had the, the Shenzhen comp, which is more sort of small cap, um, tech focused. Um, Shanghai comp tends to be your sort of blue chip um, state of enterprise. And then, you, and then there was the China, then there's still Chinex, which was sort of your micro cap. Um, but there was a, the, there's lots of inefficiencies in that system. The, the, there's trading limits, there's um, IPO approvals, and there's lots of sort of changes that um, basically mean they're not, it's not as attractive a place to list um, as other markets. So this is why Alibaba and all the internet stocks went off to NASDAQ, because that was, that was a far better market to list in. You could do dual class shareholdings, you could list at any IPO price, you could uh, get, get international investors in. Now, China wants to basically have NASDAQ in itself. And this is basically what's launched this month. And so, not only is this a important new tech investment side, but the key for its, for its um, support level comes back to the government. Now, this is a President Xi led initiative. So, the idea of failure is not really one to uh, consider. Basically, you've got top level support for this new equity market, which is a massive change. Anyone who's looked at China for a long time, where you've already sort of, you know, you're all, always assuming it's going to be going to be debt, it's going to be sort of state-backed debt, and it's going to be basically your banking finance. The idea that you have the, the, the president basically going, no, we want, we want NASDAQ. That's such a transformative shift in the mindset of the both domestic investor but also the financing structure of, of China that it's, it's going to be transformative. Now, there's obviously a risk that it could get out of control. I mean, China is well known for speculative, um, um, speculative uh, uh, bubbles. Um, we just need to think of 2015, where we had the stock market go over 100% and then crash spectacularly uh, before it was bailed out. So you do have this risk that basically if they introduce a new market and there's speculation that we end up with a, another bubble and then a crash. Um, but there's lots of mechanisms. I mean, to be honest, it's not just us that's aware of this. This is all the regulators and the government are quite aware of this too. And there's quite a lot of mechanisms put in place to try and prevent that. So we're now at the cusp of sort of a major experimentation um, in, China's, um, in China's overall capital markets. And this is what, uh, yeah, one of the reasons why it's very, very interesting to me sort of where we are, where we are now. Um, and in terms of how we see um, the market at the moment, uh, just in terms of the general general view of the existing market, um, it's, a, it's in quite an interesting space as well. So basically last year, liquidity sucked all the money out of the market. The market fell, you had a, bit, a bear market. Um, and that basically um, led you into the, into the trough in, in, in Q3 into Q4. Then you had the loosening. And that was a signal, that was a massive signal, despite all the trade war problems to the domestic investors as in buying to the market now, we're now getting into a looser, um, a looser monetary policy environment. We saw Q1, mass, I mean, that was a lovely quarter, uh, a big surge, but a lot of that was about valuation repair. Um, we went from eight times on the Shanghai comp to 12 times. So that was basically just repairing the, 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 the correction that we saw in 2018. What we're looking for now is basically the fundamentals to then catch up with that. So what we think, with all the economic stabilization now, we think the, the fundamentals start catching up with the valuation in Q3 into Q4, um, where a lot of the key sectors are then seeing growth again um, after what was, has been quite a difficult time. So, um, and our, on the Asia's in particular, so, so our Shunigami's are the, the Asia strategist, he thinks this, this could be, we're basically entering the second phase of a bull run. Um, we've had the valuation for the first phase, we're now in the second phase where the fundamentals catch up with valuation and we get the next leg up. And then the debate is to get the next leg up, which is the third phase, which is the speculation, as in 2015, 2013, 2007, 2005, and 1997. Um, but we're not there yet. We've still basically got another two to three years where you're talking about fundamental upside 
building into a potentially plus combined with more money flowing into the equity markets, which then supports the overall liquidity situation. So high top, um, despite the trade war, despite all the wobbles, is still is still on the long term um, very confident on the, on the Chinese equity markets, and um, and we look forward to then the launch of how the, the new Chinese Nasdaq, um, which is going to be quite an eye opener for um, and transformative, I think, for for the Chinese economy. สำหรับภาพรวมนะคะที่ทางคุณมิลานาเขาให้เราฟังนะคะบอกครั้งแรกเลยนะคะที่มาในกรุงเทพในนามของไฮตงด้วยนะคะแล้วก็ต้องยอมรับนะคะว่าตลาดจีนเองนะคะตอนนี้เนี่ยนักลงทุนทั่วโลกก่อนหน้านี้ก็ให้ความสนใจนะคะแล้วก็ทางด้านของประเด็นในจีนเนี่ยก็คือ2ประเด็นใหญ่ก็หนีไปพ้นเรื่องของเศรษฐกิจภายในประเทศเองที่มีการปรับตัวด้วยเป็นนิวนอร์มอลนะคะแล้วก็เรื่องของเฟดบอลระหว่างสหรัฐกับจีนนะคะแต่ก็มีหลายประเด็นทีเดียวนะคะที่จีนเองเนี่ยมีเหตุการณ์ที่ทําให้นักทุนทั่วโลกอาจจะมีความหวั่นใจในการลงทุนนะคะในช่วงที่ผ่านมาไม่ว่าจะเป็นเรื่องของ shadow banking P2P นะคะหรือแม้แต่เรื่องของ lending หรือการกู้ยืมต่างๆนะคะแต่ว่าต้องยอมรับว่าในช่วงที่ผ่านมาทางด้านของประเทศจีนเองปลายปีที่แล้วเราก็เห็นนะคะตั้งแต่เดือนตุลาคมเนี่ยเขาก็มีการปรับนะคะสำหรับในเรื่องของตัวดีเลเวอร์เรจิ่งเองนะคะตัวชาร์โดแบงกิ้งเองนะคะแล้วก็ในด้านของภาครัฐเองเขาก็จริงจังนะคะก็สามารถที่จะจัดการได้ภาพรวมดีขึ้นนะคะแล้วก็เราเห็นด้วยว่าส่งผลต่อภาพของตลาดทุนด้วยเช่นเดียวกันนะคะเราก็เลยเห็นตั้งแต่ปลายปีที่แล้วนะคะภาพของตลาดจีนเนี่ยดูเหมือนว่าจะมีทิศทางที่จดสายขึ้นมาได้บ้างนะคะแต่ว่าก็ไม่จบเท่านั้นนะคะเพราะว่าปัจจัยภายในของเขาพอเริ่มซาเนี่ยก็เริ่มมีเทรดบอลของทรัมป์เข้ามาเป็นปัจจัยกวนใหม่นะคะซึ่งทางด้านของมิลานก็บอกว่ามันไม่ใช่แค่เรื่องของการค้าเพียงอย่างเดียวนะคะแต่ว่าเราต้องยอมรับว่ามีเบื้องลึกเบื้องหลังมากกว่านั้นไม่ว่าจะเป็นเรื่องของ IP นะคะเอ็นเทเลชวลพรอพเพอร์ตี้นะคะหรือแม้แต่เรื่องเทคโนโลยีเรื่องของการเมืองระหว่างประเทศนะคะซึ่งก็จะเป็นน้อยให้กับนักลงทุนอย่างระยะยาวด้วยนะคะไม่ใช่แค่ในระยะเวลาสั้นๆนะคะแต่อย่างไรก็ตามค่ะทางด้านของบรรดาเขาบอกว่าอยากให้มองในระยะยาวกว่านั้นนะคะเพราะว่าจีนเองเขาก็สร้างฐานใหม่ไม่ว่าจะเป็นเรื่องของการแอนตี้คอร์รัปชันคือจัดการเรื่องคอร์รัปชันอย่างจริงจังนะคะแล้วก็จัดการเรื่องของสถาบันการเงินแล้วก็การกู้ยืมที่เป็นสีเทาด้วยความตั้งใจจริงนะคะจนเห็นผลอย่างชัดเจนแต่ถ้าถามว่าเทรดทอลที่หลายคนกังวลอยู่ตอนนี้เนี่ยระยะเวลาไทม์ไลน์ของมิลันดาที่มองไว้เนี่ยก็น่าจะอยู่ที่การหารือในช่วง6ถึง9เดือนข้างหน้านี้นะคะแต่ถามว่าอาจจะมีผลต่อเนื่องไหมก็คงต้องยอมรับนะคะว่าปฏิเสธผลที่เกิดขึ้นแล้วไม่ได้ไม่ว่าจะเป็นซัพพลายเชนนะคะหรือว่าการลงทุนที่ออกจากประเทศจีนไปจํานวนไม่น้อยในช่วงที่เกิดเทรดทอลขึ้นนะคะเพราะว่าทําให้ความน่าสนใจของจีนนะคะในการที่ดึงดูดเม็ดเงินของต่างชาติเนี่ยลดลงไปค่ะอย่างไรก็ตามนะคะพอทางด้านของจีนเขาเห็นนะคะว่าภาพของเศรษฐกิจเองนะคะภาพของปัจจัยภายในประเทศได้รับผลกระทบจากข้างนอกเนี่ยเขาก็มีมาตรการต่างๆนะคะเพื่อมากระตุ้นเศรษฐกิจไม่ว่าจะเป็นเรื่องของการดึงดูดทางภาษีก็คือหันภาษีนะคะหรือแม้แต่สนับสนุนภาคอุตสาหกรรมนะคะเราเลยเห็นตัวเลขของภาคธุรกิจจีนนะคะอย่างเรือเอสเตทเองก็ยังขยับขึ้นได้หลายคนกังวลว่าจะเกิดแคชหรือเปล่านะคะแต่ว่าภาพที่เห็นก็คือยังโตได้นะคะประมาณ 5-10% แม้ว่าแลนด์เซลล์หรือยอดขายเนี่ยบางส่วนเนี่ยก็ลดลงด้วยนะคะก็ไม่ไม่น่าจะเกิดบับเบิลในมุมที่หลายคนกังวลกันนะคะแล้วก็เศรษฐกิจเองนะคะของจีนเขาก็มีการพัฒนาโครงสร้างพื้นฐานอย่างต่อเนื่องรวมถึงเรื่องของ 5G ที่ถือว่าเป็นการเปลี่ยนแปลงอีกครั้งหนึ่งที่สําคัญไม่น้อยนะคะอย่างไรก็ตามปัจจัยที่ต้องกังวลก็ยังมีอยู่บ้างนะคะไม่ว่าจะเป็นภาระหนี้สินนะคะทั้งคอร์เปอเรทเดเองนะคะตัว household debt แล้วก็ก็เป็น debt ที่เพิ่มสูงขึ้นอย่างต่อเนื่องโดยเฉพาะตัว corporate debt ที่พุ่งถึง 160% นะคะอย่างไรก็ตามค่ะในเรื่องของการเกินทุนการค้าเนี่ยช่วงที่ผ่านมาก็ถือว่าปรับตัวลดลงนะคะแล้วก็อย่างไรก็ตามแม้ว่าทางด้านของภาพการดึงดูดการลงทุนด้วยต้นทุนราคาถูกของจีนเนี่ยอาจจะน้อยลงไปนะคะเพราะว่ามีเรื่องของ trade tension ที่ยังไม่จบแต่ถ้าดูตัวเลข direct investment นะคะที่มาที่